Hello guys, today I am back with another Baldur's Gate 3 video, because I just can't help but be hyped for this game. For those of you that don't know, Baldur's Gate 3 is a new story-rich party-based RPG set in the Dungeons & Dragons universe, and it is the game I am most excited for right now. With its release being only a few months away, I thought it would be a great time to take a closer look at the companions that we are going to be meeting on our journey through Faerun. As a fan of Bioware games and specifically Dragon Age, companions are always one of the highlights for me when playing through a well-crafted story. So naturally, I was thrilled to hear about the recruitable companions in Baldur's Gate 3. And when I played through the early access, I was not disappointed. On the contrary, I couldn't get enough. I went on to do multiple playthroughs, trying out different classes, discovering new areas and trying new dialogue options. The game has tons and tons of great content to offer, and if you want to hear about all the things I'm excited about, you can check out my previous Baldur's Gate 3 video, where I talk about all the reasons I'm hyped for this game. For this video though, as I said, we'll be focusing on the companions. So grab yourself a nice cup of tea, and let me tell you all about the Baldur's Gate 3 companions. Before I start, I need to give you a quick spoiler warning. This video is going to go into details about what we currently know about the BG3 companions, which is everything that is revealed in the early access. Now it's nothing too major really, mostly things related to their backgrounds, and we find out about them pretty early in the game, as the early access takes place in Act 1, and I'm assuming Larian are saving all the major stuff for the later acts in the full game. But I thought I'd give you a warning just in case you haven't played the early access and want to save it all for the full game. So, you've been warned. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's start with our first companion, Lazel. Lazel is a fierce Githyanki fighter, and she's the first companion you meet in the early access. You meet her on the Nautiloid ship as you make your way through, and she helps you fight off some enemies, although she doesn't fully join the party until later. Githyanki are generally very skilled in combat, but most of them are aggressive, arrogant, and cruel. Lazel, like her kin, is an excellent fighter, but she is also a bit of an asshole. That large, fleshy nose of yours looks like a mistake. She's blunt, ruthless, and she doesn't really seem to care what other people think. Her direct personality, however, also makes her very honest. She says what's on her mind, and we know she means what she says. And that makes her, despite her aggressive personality, also one of the most trustworthy companions that we currently have in early access. While it's impossible to know if she has any ulterior motives, it seems to me that all she wants to do is get rid of the Mind Flayer tadpole that has been planted in our brains. And yes, while she's only in our party because we're useful to keep around, I don't get the impression that she's secretly plotting to betray us at some point. I feel like if Lazelle wants to get rid of us, she's not the kind of person that would stab you in the back. She'll just stab you in the face. But ultimately, we'll have to wait and see what happens in the full game. Of course, I might be proven wrong. But I think if you look past her aggressive demeanor and warm up to her bluntness, you will be able to appreciate Lazel for who she is. A straight to the point kick-ass fighter that certainly pulls no punches and does what she does best. Fuck shit up. Preferably for our enemies. She is also the person that, out of all the party members, knows most about the tadpole and mind flayers in general. Her people have a long and bloody history with the mind flayers. Basically, the Gith were enslaved by Mind Flayers for several millennia before eventually freeing themselves and making it their goal to completely annihilate the entire Mind Flayer race, lest they ever try to enslave them again. So naturally, she would know a lot about this topic, and her knowledge of the Tadpole and Mind Flayers will certainly come in handy. It starts with a fever and memory loss. Then you start to hallucinate. Your hair falls out, and you bleed from every orifice. Your bones will change form. Your jaw will split to allow room for four great tentacles. All skin will turn to gore and be shed to reveal new flesh underneath. Then you have ceased to exist, and a mind flayer is born. Ultimately, Lazel is a product of her culture. She is the way she is because she was raised that way. During your time with her in early access, it becomes clear that she wants to prove herself worthy in the eyes of the Githyanki Lich Queen leader Vlakith, who she devotes herself to. However, as her arc progresses, things happen and she will begin to have doubts about her people. Who knows, maybe Lazelle will eventually warm up to us. Maybe she'll even be happy to call us a friend one day. 
And maybe, just maybe, she'll even be nice. You do well to observe more and question less. The next companion we meet is the half L Shadowheart. Shadowheart is a loyal cleric of Shar, and we first meet her on the Mind Flayer ship as she is stuck in one of the pods. You can choose to free her from the pod, for which she will be grateful, and if you do, she will join the party as you look for a way off the ship, but not before grabbing a strange looking item from the pod. After a ship crashes and we wake up on the beach, Shadowheart can be found again not too far away. We again get a glimpse of the mysterious item that she is carrying. And we even have the option of attempting to take the item before waking the unconscious Shadowheart. After she's awake, she suggests teaming up to look for a healer that might be able to get rid of the tadpole, as their odds are probably better together than apart. Shadowheart is a pretty private person, and she doesn't share much with us until we spend some time with her and prove to her that she can trust us. When she does, it is revealed that she is one of Shar's dark disciples, and the only survivor of a holy mission to retrieve a mysterious artifact, the very same that she is carrying and deliver it to a hidden cloister in Baldur's Gate. Getting her to open up about all of this might take some time or some successful persuasion roles though. She values her privacy and doesn't like it when being pressed to talk about herself or her background. And she is not afraid to let you know when you're being nosy. Just don't expect me to entertain your questions if you won't respect my privacy. But she clearly appreciates it when her boundaries are being respected. I need to get to Baldur's Gate. There's someone waiting for me there. Someone I have to reach. As soon as possible. Thank you. And you're right. It's a delicate matter. Not something for light conversation. Shadowheart can be pretty sarcastic, especially if you get on her bad side. And she might even come off as a bit of a selfish person. But if you get to know her and she trusts you, you will see that she can actually be a really sweet person. And that she does care about others, which even she seems to be surprised about. You know who I never thought I'd find myself caring for? Exactly right. Never gave them much thought. Certainly not that bunch in the grove. Yet we came through for them. We saved their lives. Odd. In a romance scene, she genuinely seems interested to know more about our character. Nothing related to the tadpole or slaying goblins, just them as a person. She's also willing to open up more about herself, although she's not able to share much. Apart from liking night orchids and not being able to swim, there is not much more she can tell about herself. As a Shar worshipper, it is not unheard of to sacrifice your own memories when ordered to. A lot of the little things, she says, are lost to her right now. So that begs the question, who was Shadowheart before she became a Shar worshipper? Or has she always been one? Did she become a follower of Shar on her own volition, or is there more to it? I guess we will have to find out in the full game. Whichever companion you encounter next depends on the route you take. As you make your way through the crashed Nautilord ship towards the roadside cliff waypoint, a human wizard named Gale will spawn from the waypoint and appear in front of you. Gale seems to be an okay guy. And although he can come across a little bit cocky at times, he is generally nice towards us, and he approves of things that are considered good aligned. When asked to tell us a little bit about himself, he says that he is a wizard of considerable acclaim, hailing from Waterdeep. He has a cat, a library, and he has a weakness for a good glass of wine. All is not as simple as it seems, however, for Gale is carrying a dark secret that could have catastrophic consequences. When his approval is high enough, he will reveal that he has a, a complicated relationship with magic. Or rather, the goddess of magic, Mistra. According to Gale, when he was young, he was so talented at the arts of magic that it attracted Mistra's attention. Mistra showed him the secrets beneath the magical veils as she whispered to him that he was the chosen one. He fell in love with her, and they enjoyed each other's company. But one day, the whisper stopped and the young wizard was left behind, heartbroken. In a desperate attempt to win back the goddess's love, the wizard did something foolish. He sought out an ancient piece of magic, sealed away in a tome of gateways, in the hopes of returning it to Mistra. But his plan backfired, and now he is stuck with the Nedri's orb inside his chest that needs to be fed magic in order to remain stable. If it becomes unstable, 
It will explode with a force that could level a city the size of Waterdeep. So it seems we'll need to help him find a way to either learn to control the orb's magic or to get rid of it completely. In the meantime, though, we'll have to keep it stable by feeding it magic. And unfortunately, the best way of doing that is to give Gale magical items that we find so that he can feed them to the orb. Which is kind of unfortunate. And we don't have to help him, but Gale certainly won't appreciate that. And then there is also this. And if you see this manifestation, that means I have prematurely perished. However, for reasons that cannot be disclosed, it is of vital importance that my death be remedied at your earliest convenience. You may rest assured that I do not speak out of self-preservation alone. Many lives depend on my return to the living within the span of two days. I trust I've made myself clear. So yeah, Gil certainly is an interesting character with seemingly a lot of secrets. Maybe just as much as Shadowheart. And I'm honestly curious to find out where all this will go in the full game. As you explore the beach near the Nautiloid shipwreck, you will come across an elf asking for your help in killing another one of those brain things. Luckily, the creature he has cornered isn't an intellect devourer. It's only a boar. Hey, good news! Nothing to worry about, it's only a- and he's pulled a dagger on us. Thankfully, this is all just a misunderstanding when the elf realizes we are not the ones who captured him. We are also a victim of the Mind Flayers and are also carrying a tadpole in our brains just like him. Crisis averted. The elf's name is Astarion, and he's a rogue from Baldur's Gate. He seems to be more of a neutral aligned character, and maybe even a little evil leaning as he seems to approve of some more evil things we can do in a game. He is pretty selfish, greedy, and a bit power hungry. And kind of similar to Lazel, he doesn't try to hide that fact. But of course, there is a bit more to him than that. If the pale skin, red eyes, and pointy fangs didn't immediately give it away, he is a vampire spawn. He was enslaved for nearly 200 years by the vampire lord Cazador, and the only reason he is here right now is because he got captured by mind flayers. For 200 years, he was his master's puppet, forced to do whatever his master wanted him to do, tortured and only allowed to feed on rats. Now with the tadpole, he is finally able to walk in the sunlight again, and with these new powers, he might finally be able to escape Cazador for good. Now, as I said, Astarion is generally a selfish character. And whereas most of the party members want to find a way to get rid of the tadpole, Astarion's goal is to learn how to control it. And I suspect this is very much related to him getting his revenge on Cazador, or mainly to be free from his former master and live his own life again without constantly having to watch his back. I spent centuries as the victim of a corrupt man. It was the Mind Flayers that plucked me away from that. They gave me a gift. The strength to take my own freedom! Whether his personality is a result of him being tortured for 200 years, or if he was always an asshole, I'm not sure. Maybe his cocky and cruel behavior is just a mask that he uses to cope with the years of trauma that he is carrying. After all, he seems to be open about his past as a vampire spawn after a secret is revealed and leaves himself pretty vulnerable by revealing this information, as Cazador is certainly still trying to chase him down. And believe it or not, Astarion does have a lot of genuine moments that make me think that, deep down, he is actually not that bad of a person. Oh, you meant be kinder. Pet bunnies, that sort of thing. I have no objection to being nice, of course, once I have the power to bend others to my will. Or maybe it's just all manipulation. Who knows? Either way, like all of the other companions, I am curious to learn more about this character and his backstory. We've talked a lot about secretive companions in this video, but one that might not seem so secretive at first is Will, also known as the Blade of Frontiers. A brave and mighty hero that has made a good name for himself slaying monsters and ridding the world of evil. He helps people in need and tells stories about his great accomplishments. Living legend in the flesh. Slayer of spectres, killer of kobolds. The pride of Baldur's Gate. But just like the others, there is a little bit more to him than that. Will did not acquire his powers by training alone. One day, a goblin named Spike burned down his village and took his eye in the process. 
When Spike left them all to burn, he swore to the heavens and to the hells that he'd make him pay. It was then that a woman rose from the ashes, Mizora. She promised him that he would have his revenge. She'd give him powers and make him into a hero. He'd be able to slay any enemy and save every victim. The only thing she wanted in return was his endless devotion. And it was only after Will agreed to her proposal that she revealed what she really was. A Cambion. Half human, half devil. As a warlock, Will gets his powers from Mizora, his patron. But in exchange, he is forced to aid Mizora whenever she calls on him. And when she demanded a price that he was unwilling to pay, he told her he wanted out. However, Will and Mizora both got captured by the Mind Flayers. When a ship crashed, Spike, the same goblin that burned down his village, broke her out of her pod and took her somewhere. He's been trying to find a way to free her ever since. It came a time I wanted out. I was telling Mizora just that when the Squiddy snatched us both. After the crash, goblins plucked her from her pod and... Well, I reckon you know the rest. I don't know what the drow want with Mizora, but she promised to break our bond if I save her. I free her, and she frees me. The bargain is void if she's killed, near as I can tell. A nigh impossible task, even for the blade. If the drow slayed her, they'd do me a great favor. Or so I think on the darkest days. But she still lives. They want something from her. Gods know what. The way Will behaves makes him seem like a true hero. A good guy. He always wants to do what's right, and he approves when we do good things. But there's a darker side to him. He is willing to go very far to get Mazora back. Even willing to torture a guy if Spike doesn't give him the answers he is looking for. Which, for a guy that calls himself a hero, is not a very heroic thing to do. The gnome will survive. This cockroach comes first. So that makes me wonder if Will is truly the good guy he says he is. If his reasons for freeing Mazora are really him wanting to break the pact. He says that killing her would be doing him a favor, but something tells me he doesn't want her dead. And I think there's a possibility there is a bit more going on between these two. So these are the recruitable companions we get in Early Access. But they aren't the only ones that stick around after we've met them. As of Early Access, we also have two camp followers. They don't follow us as we venture out into the world, but they'll be at our camp whenever we take a long rest and we're able to talk to them just like our companions. The first camp follower is Volo. Now, if his name sounds familiar, that might be because Volo is a pretty famous character, or infamous character, I should say, in the D&D universe. He also appeared in the first two Baldur's Gate games, and if you wonder how he has survived for so long, the simple answer is... magic. In Baldur's Gate 3, Volo can be encountered in the Druid's Grove, where he immediately wants to interview you about your recent fight with goblins. He expresses interest in the goblins and their newfound worship of the mysterious Absolute, and tells us he is on his way to their camp as we speak. I've interrogated one, a captive in this very camp. She reports they've abandoned their god, Maglaviet, in favor of someone called the Absolute. The scandal! Later, he can indeed be encountered in a goblin camp where he is being held captive. If we free him, he joins the party as our camp follower. When we tell him about our little tadpole problem, Volo claims to know a lot about the subject and offers to remove the tadpole for us, which may or may not result in the loss of an eye. Our next camp follower is Daddy Hels- uh, <coughs> I mean the Druid Helsing. Helsing is the first druid of the Druid's Grove, but he has been missing for a while. We find him in the Goblin's Camp as well, where he is also being held captive. If we free him, he will join our camp, where he tells us he was looking into the tadpole situation, and tells us there is almost certainly a cure to be found at a place called Moonrise Towers. Getting there might be quite a challenge, however, as the only ways of reaching it are through the Underdark, or through a cursed place where everything is shrouded in shadow, affecting anything that passes through it. Helsin also tells us that he has been wanting to go to Moonrise Towers for a while now, as he has been seeking a way to end the shadow curse. I helped overthrow Ketherick Thorm and his Dark Justicias years ago, but I failed to prevent him from unleashing darkness across the region before he was defeated. I spent years researching the curse, 
trying to put an end to it. Nothing has worked. Yet, if I can join you and get close to Moonrise, perhaps I can lift this curse. Same as you may find a cure for your infection. So that's another character with seemingly an interesting backstory. While not a full companion, it seems Halsin might stick around for a while. The last characters I'm going to talk about only briefly. They are currently not in early access, but they've been confirmed to be companions once the full game releases. Minsk and Jahira. Minsk, a heroic human ranger, and his miniature giant space hamster Boo are born heroes. They live to defeat evil and do some good butt kicking. Jahira is a half elf fighter druid and a former member of the Harpers. Both Minsk and Jahira ruined the previous Baldur's Gate games as party members. Minsk is a kind hearted but befuddled Reshamar warrior that has enjoyed many adventures across the Sword Coast and beyond. During the events of the first two Baldur's Gate games, he potentially travels alongside our character and aids them in their adventures, slaying evil when he can. Jahira used to serve as an agent of the Harpers, along with her husband Khalid, who unfortunately is killed during the events of Baldur's Gate 2. She is determined and not afraid to speak up about what she thinks. She too journeyed with our character in the previous Baldur's Gate games and is even a potential romance option in Baldur's Gate 2. It's great seeing these characters make a return in the third game, and I'm honestly really looking forward to seeing how they will further develop. And that's it for the companions in Baldur's Gate 3. I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, thank you so much for watching. If you liked this video, let me know by liking this video, or leave a comment and let me know if you'd like to see more Baldur's Gate 3 content. Want me to take an even closer look at some of the companions? Have you played the early access? What do you think of the companion so far? That's all for now though. Thanks again for watching and I hope to see you on the next one.